Thank you very much for the invitation, and it's a great pleasure to talk to you tonight about uh, one of my favorite places. Uh, this is where I started as an undergrad student and did my uh, bachelor mapping and my bachelor research thesis on the Isle of Rum in Scotland. And it's one of these fascinating places. Um, it's known as the Forbidden Isle because up to the 1950s, it was privately owned and you couldn't easily go there. And since the 1950s, it's been a nature reserve. It was bought by uh, the government and now people can go there and do research. And uh, it's uh, most famous for the layered ultra basic intrusion. And uh, there is a few other kind of things I find personally very interesting, what most people not are, are not necessarily fully aware of. And that is there's some felsic rocks there as well. And I'd like to kind of talk today a little bit about both of these stages as it's known on ROM. And uh, here's a little bit of a summary of what I'm gonna talk about. I'll say a few words about the British and Irish Paleocene Igneous province to start with. Then I will go into the evolutionary stages on the ROM Igneous complex. I will start with the second stage, the ultra basic layered suite. And then uh, we will look uh, at some sub aspects here. I will start with sedimentation in magmatic systems. We will also look a little bit at in situ crystallization and then uh, also at post cumulus processes. Before we move on to the first stage in the evolution of rum of the rum igneous complex, and that is the felsic rocks that are uh, eruptive ignimbrites and granites. And then uh, I will uh, have a little excursion into ongoing work on isotope geochemistry and some experiments. So um, the British and Irish Paleocene Igneous province goes back to the opening of the North Atlantic. And the Atlantic opened, at least in that part of the world, from the south towards the north. And uh, so it's a bit like an unsipping, if you will. And uh, currently the active part is what we believe to be under Iceland. And uh, we have, uh, uh, on either side of Iceland, we have uh, eruptive rocks and igneous centers that go back to this initial start of the province. And that includes uh, East and West Greenland, as well as Irish and Scottish Paleocene lava fields and igneous centers. And uh, the opening of the North Atlantic in this part of the world manifested itself in igneous activity from about 61 to 55 million years. And uh, this is also about the age of the rum igneous complex. And um, here a few kind of impressions from Northern Ireland, uh, some famous places like the Giant's Causeway, of course, and then some lavas on chalk. Uh, these are kind of marking the transition between the Cretaceous and the Paleocene or the tertiary as it was formerly known. And uh, why did igneous activity happen in this part of the world? Well, it's believed that there was a crustal thin spot. It's uh, believed that the plume was able to penetrate through the crust, through the lithosphere at this point, which I marked here with this little red circle, uh, because there was pre-existing fractures and this led to magma rising up there preferentially already in the early stages of the opening of the North Atlantic at about 61 to 62 million years. Later on, once the Atlantic was rifting, then uh, there was more activity, which is now represented in submarine lava fields and centers, and this lasted to about 55 million years. So why study this part of the world? Well, uh, first of all, it was the defining place for concepts like cone sheets, ring dikes, even magma series come from there, going back to Mr. Harker in 1908. And uh, it's something else that I find very useful here, and that is uh, there's actually quite few places out there where we can see deep plutons, hip abyssals, or sort of half deep rocks like dike swarms, and also rocks that have erupted. And uh, here we can really pierce these things together. And uh, this gives us a much, much more improved understanding. In active volcanic uh, regions, you can see the volcanic cones, but you can't see underneath. In deeply eroded old terrains, you like in Sweden, you can see the deeper parts quite well, but not so much the upper parts. In the British and Irish Paleocene Igneous province, you get a bit of both. And uh, it's also very useful because we have a full suite from Mafic 
to very felsic rocks, to uh, from mafic cumulates and flood basalts to granites and eruptive rhyolites. So we can learn a lot about magmatic processes. Now, here's a little overview map from Emileos and Bell. And um, here we see the igneous centers on the right hand side in green. And Rum is the uh, second one from the top below sky. And in black, we have the dike swarms and they give a sense for the rifting at the time. So these were fractures that opened up and uh, they were filled with a rising magma at the time. So this goes back to the opening of the North Atlantic at about uh, 61 to 58, 50, 56. And eventually we had more activity further out. There's the Blackstone Bank. It's this little uh, green area, green um, uh, with stripes. That's a bit further out. And then there's some submarine submerged uh, areas which have uh, uh, which can be seen seismically and uh, they would then be the younger activity once the rifting had really gone to full scale. Now the Isle of Rum itself it sits on a fault and maybe not surprisingly uh, this is believed to be the main reason for the location of the igneous center. It's the long loch fault because there's a, a, a loch a lake and it's rather long because it sits on the fault. I'll show you some pictures in a few minutes. And uh, uh, the igneous center clusters around this fault. And there's a few other faults in the area, but the Long Loch Fault, which is a strike slip fault, it seems to have been a key player. And there's good evidence that the fault was active prior to igneous activity and it was also active after igneous activity. So this has been a structural feature that likely gave rise to the origin of the Rum Igneous Center. And here is the Long Loch, and uh, it's uh, not too spectacular. Actually, um, it's there because somebody dammed it up. One of the landowners, he wanted to start fishing, and so he dammed it up. And uh, the uh, valley, the, the, the fault valley, is now filled with this little loch. And uh, this gave rise to the fault that was geologically mapped a little later then. So the geological setting, well, as I said in the introduction, rum is best known for its layered suite. And this was um, really kind of highlighted by Mr. Wager, the person who discovered the Skergard. He was also interested in other layered intrusions. And so he sent students to rum. And uh, prior to the layered suite, we have a volcanic episode recorded on the island. And uh, that's now into marginal zones. And I will also talk about these areas. That's the northern marginal complex and the southern marginal zone or southern mountains zone. And all of them are within a ring fault. And then in the western part of the complex, we have um, fine grained granifier that's usually referred to as the western granite. The beauty about this is we can see this former roof. And this is what you see in the uh, central panel here. We have the former roof being partly exposed, which allows us to really project the roof above the pluton, above the intrusion. And it gives us a sense of where we are within this intrusion. And that means that the exposed layered rocks must have been very close to the roof of the magma system. And there must have been a volcano above that's now gone by erosion. So stage one, as I mentioned before, was the felsic areas. And here's a little uh, image of uh, one of the ignimbrite deposits in these marginal zones. They are just sitting a thin slivers on top of the uh, layered intrusion. And uh, we'll come back to those a little later. But I thought I'll mention them right at this stage so that we all have a sense for the evolutionary history at this point already. So the... Uh, uh, famous part, the ultra basic pluton, that's uh, the layered suite and uh, there's a whole series of exposed layers. And uh, I will start talking about this in a little more detail now before we go back to the marginal zones. So here is the geological map draped over the um, uh, topography and uh, this is viewed from the northwest. And there you can see the Long Loch Fault, that's the central feature here, that displaces the bluish rocks and the blue and purple rocks and the uh, turquoise green rocks. They are the ultra uh, basic rocks. And the orange rocks and the gray rocks, they are part of the marginal zone rocks. 
They are the felsic rocks. The pink one is the Western granite and the intense colors in the uh, bottom right, they are younger lavas. They come probably from sky and they sit on the granite and I'll mention the story about those a little later. They are very important to date the activity or the lifespan of the volcano, but they are technically not strictly part of the rum volcano. So um, this is kind of how it looks and um, let's move on. This is now a view from the northern marginal zone looking onto Halival, one of the main kind of layered hills in the ultra mafic and ultra basic complex. And in the foreground, we have these light gray rocks. They are ignimbrites uh, of rhyodacite composition and the darker rocks in the rear, that is uh, the layered rocks of the uh, ultra basic intrusion. There is a stripe of greenish material <clears throat> in between the gray and the darker rocks and that's the marginal gabbro. The marginal gabbro happens to be very good for grass growing. It's very fertile, it seems, much more so than the ultra basic as well as the felsic rocks. So uh, the marginal gabbro is extremely badly exposed, uh, but it's very obvious because it's a vegetated stripe between these two areas. And this is a different perspective on the same rocks. And on the right hand side, we have the layered ultra basic pluton. And on the left, we have the gray rocks of the marginal zone. And then we have this more vegetated uh, part in the middle, which uh, has virtually no outcrops. This is um, done at a different season, so it's less green, but you can see the lack of outcrops gives you a sense for the grass growing there rather well. So, and here we have um, a view from also in the Northeast, but now we are in the ultra um, basic Pluton and the light colored rocks in the front, they are st still felsic rocks, but uh, Halival and uh, Askival mountain is picking through in the far distance, but the main mountain in the center is Halival. And there we can see several of the famous units, the layered units. And they are made from uh, troctolite and peridotite and the uh, units that stick out, that's usually the troctolite and the units that weather back, that's the olive rich peridotite. And the units are of different thickness. This is why some of them are quite regularly spaced, others follow in quick succession. And uh, here's a view from closer to Halival summit. This is a view looking towards the north now. And this is um, one of my former Trinity colleagues taking a little break here. And uh, this is the layers in, uh, in a more close up fashion. So there's about 16 mapped layers and uh, it's believed that they represent major pulses. Over the last few years, it's been uh, rather obvious that many of the main pulses were likely made up of small pulses within the main units, but I think it still holds true to this day that we're talking about at least 16 major intrusive pulses that started off with olivin being uh, settled out, followed by more feldspar, therefore giving rise to peridotite followed by troctolite, troctolite being uh, olivin and feldspar rich rock. So this uh, map here comes from Emaleos 96, and this is probably one of the best papers on the layered ultra basic uh, Pluton. And uh, these layers can be traced for several kilometers around the hills of Halival and Askival. And in cross section, it looks a bit like this. We have uh, these layered units and we have the marginal zones sitting as a thin veneer on top of the intrusion of the uh, layered intrusion. And uh, there, these thin veneer rocks, they give us a lot of information about the early history of the Pluton, but uh, it's the layered um, um, Pluton that really tells us about how magma was recharged into the system and how this volcano may have built up. There was some uh, studies on uh, geophysics that are summarized in the uh, geological memoir published by Emelaeus 97. And um, this is some gravity modeling on uh, a gravity survey that was done. And depending on what rock types you assume, you can project the uh, Pluton, the uh, layered Pluton downwards for several kilometers. If you want to have it only peridotite, it would have to extend for some eight kilometers downwards. If you want to have it mixed with peridotite and uh, also gabbro and troctolite, 
then it would actually go down by something like 16 kilometers. So this is a huge pluton that's below the surface and that's likely continuing in this layered fashion below the exposure that we see in the mountains on Rum. So there is likely a big kind of cylinder of more intrusive material that's going there. And remember the crust is not so thick in that part of the world. Um, so the better part of the crust seems to be affected by the pluton that um, makes up the Rome igneous complex. So now I'd like to talk a little bit more about these units here. And uh, one of the pioneering people here was Mr. Brown. Brown was a PhD student of Mr. Wager. And uh, Wager being the person who discovered the Scareguard, he sent Mr. Brown to do some uh, PhD work on uh, the Isle of Rum. And uh, Brown mapped these uh, units. And the type unit uh, was unit 10. That was his favorite unit. And it's given here as uh, uh, height in feet. And uh, the height is about uh, 300 feet. That's about 100 meters. And uh, here what we see is that there's a lot of olivin up to 80 percent in the lower part and about two-thirds up the olivin drops quite rapidly and plagioclase becomes the dominant mineral going then up to about 80 percent as well and uh, pyroxene is present but it's overall not a key player here in the pluton apart from in some gabbro intrusions we we'll mention them a little later and uh, so this led Mr. Brown to the idea that initially we had olivine either nucleating or coming with the replenishing magma and that would settle out first. And then we later had plagioclase joining and eventually plagioclase becomes the dominant mineral creating initially a peridotite layer followed by a troctolite layer. Mr. Brown also uh, noted that some of the units have a very thin seam of chromite at the very base. So he uh, noted that uh, this sequence might actually be started by chromite and uh, these chromite layers are, they're kind of a little um, uh, rarer than one might think on rum. Um, it's now believed that there's a chromite deposit offshore from all the washed out chromite, but in the pluton they're not that uh, thick and uh, they are nowadays protected. You must actually ask for permission to sample them. Here's a few thin section impressions and we have a feldspathic peridotite in the top um, left and then a troctolite in the right hand side and here's one of these boundaries marked with a chromite seam in the bottom left hand side. It's uh, troctolite in the lower part in the lower right of this image and then the chromite is the dark uh, mineral, the kind of uh, little square shaped uh, crystals. And then we have a peridotite, the olivin and uh, feldspar starting above. So this, according to Mr. Brown, was a unit boundary, a clear unit boundary, which would require a new pulse of magma injection. So here's a little kind of diagram I drew for uh, my classes. And uh, the idea is that uh, if you start off with a magma and you let this crystallize and you settle the crystals out, then you can create a cumulate which has a different composition to the starting magma and you, a, uh, and you produce a residual liquid which has also a different composition. So when you separate liquid and crystals, you can produce these different compositions. And uh, if you take this residual liquid and you let it crystallize again, and you settle out those crystals, you make yet again a different cumulate and you have an even more evolved residual liquid. And this is something that Mr. Brown realized already in the 50s. And this led him to postulate that there must have been a big volcano above the rum pluton. Uh, all this residual liquid that uh, is no longer there, but the cumulates um, must have gone somewhere. And although there's some dikes, uh, most of this has likely erupted according to Brown. And he postulated as one of the first that there was a big volcano above the rum pluton. There has been all sorts of discussions how big this volcano was and how deep the pluton was. Personally, I would say that uh, it could be uh, all the way from something like a Katla type volcano up to an Etna type volcano. So something between 1500 to maybe as much as 3000 meters in altitude. 
but uh, somewhere of this style, I think is not unrealistic. So now let's talk a little bit more about sedimentary processes within the pluton. And here's an outcrop of one of these chromite seams. And um, we have a um, kind of map view, first of all. And then there's a hand specimen. This is um, um, a Kurtzay of Brian O'Driscoll there. We have uh, a section through this boundary with a troctolite, the upper part of one unit in the lower uh, image, and then the peridotite above. And then we have these troughs filled with chromite. And uh, the idea here, going back to Mr. Brown, is that there was a bit of topography there, and the settling chromite would have filled this. And then there's a thin section image here with uh, chromite crystals being quite abundant in that seam, but it's not just chromite, there's also feldspar in there. So um, um, <clears throat> this image here is from uh, one of my papers, and I'll come back to the chromites a little later because the story is unfortunately a little bit more complicated, and it's hinted at in this uh, cross-section image because you can just about see some chromite already a little bit lower in that image in the troctolite. So it's not just unit boundaries, there is also some other processes that the chromite is playing a role in. Now, here's a few impressions from Halleval and also from uh, the southern part of the Rom Pluton. And here you see uh, layered units here. And uh, I mean, it's beautiful to, 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 to look at in the field and uh, several hundred meters of thickness of layered material. Halival is uh, over 700 meters tall, so uh, you can really get your eye in there and it makes for some spectacular exposures. And uh, this here is from the central part of Rum. There you can almost get a sense for uh, magmatic sedimentation. If you wouldn't know better, you'd almost think it, this is, this is uh, sandy sediments or so, but of course this is all olivine and plagioclase with a bit of pyroxene here. And um, this is from one of the central outcrops. It's called the whaleback outcrop because uh, there is a ridge that sticks out. And uh, here we have uh, various combinations of olivine ridge and plagioclase ridge rocks, uh, peridotites and troctolites effectively. And they're all dipping a little bit, but uh, they are repetitive in their kind of layering. And uh, this is a typical exposure from central rum. And um, here we see more layered rocks and some of the layers are more coarse. And what we see there is we have what I would think of as pebbles, little fragments of peridotite, the brown rock on the right hand side in a feldspathic matri matrix. And uh, here we must start to think that some of the material that was uh, accumulated at the floor of the magma system must have been already solid and broken up. So it's not just crystals that formed, in the magma that rained down, we must have had also solid material that was recycled. And uh, here's a close up from that. Here you see the feldspar forms the matrix and uh, the peridotite clasts have all sorts of uh, shapes and forms and uh, sizes as well. There's some size grading in that outcrop. So uh, here, there has been some kind of recycling of formerly solidified material that we need to accept has happened. And here's just another one with uh, the same kind of thing, but some larger class. And um, again, there is some recycling processes that become increasingly apparent. Here we have some uh, fragments of troctolytic material in some of the peridotite. So some of the layered material was clearly broken up and fell down into the substrate or the crystal mush at the base, and then it got sedimented over. And we also have that as drop stones here. Here we have some peridotite drop stones that fell into what seemingly uh, was at the time um, uh, ductile mush, and it deformed the layering in, on impact. So uh, this would imply that uh, we had a soft substrate in the magma chamber and larger pieces fell from above, probably from the side walls and the roof, maybe during earthquakes or fault movements, and uh, they would have added to this. And I'll talk a little bit more about this. 
But here, a close-up of this, the brilliantite weathers back, as we've seen in the major layers as well, and the troctolite is a bit more weathering resistant, so this is why we have a negative kind of uh, shape here for the brilliantite, but you clearly see the deformed substrates, the deformed layers, the feldspar-rich layers into which these fragments have impacted. So then uh, not only was the impact, there was also some what I would call soft sediment deformation. There was some folding, but this was folding in a hot magmatic state. And uh, there are several kind of examples that I'm showing here. There is uh, really full folds, but only sort of also some small slump structures. And uh, let me kind of zoom in a little bit here. There's some nice folding and uh, the fold hinges towards the center of the island. So this was material that slumped towards the center of the former magma chamber. And uh, this would make sense in the broadest uh, kind of scale of things. Here's uh, something from high up on the flanks of Halleval. There we have some slump structures that produce some folding. And uh, similarly here, there's some nice kind of soft sediment deformation, if you will, uh, slumping crystal moshes. And uh, the next image I'm going to show is uh, actually going back to my former supervisor from St. Andrews. This is from his lecture notes going back to the early 90s. And this is a little sketch he drew, but I liked the sketch so much, though, that I'm showing it now. This is basically trying to depict Mr. Wage's idea from the 1940s that there was crystal, uh, there was magma currents in the magma chamber, and olivin would settle first followed by plagioclase a little later. But at the same time, there must have been material slumping down from the side walls and maybe from the roof being deposited on the base of the magmatic system. So it's not just crystals raining out. Uh, it's also that material, solidified material, was recycled. Now, but where do all these crystals form? I'm giving a hint already. I think uh, many of the crystals uh, may not necessarily have formed in suspension, as we often tell the first year students. Many of the crystals have likely grown around the side walls. And I'm showing a little experiment here in the top right that goes back to Daniel Martin. And uh, he has grown crystals from salt solutions. And crystals don't grow free in suspension. They actually grow along the margins. And uh, this is also reflected in this little drawing by Mr. Marsh in the bottom left, where um, he kind of discusses how the crystals form. And he believes it forms more in an onion skin kind of fashion. And uh, these materials might then collapse. And I want to show you some uh, in situ grown crystals now from uh, the Isle of Rum. Here's some layers of Harrisite, because um, this was first described from a place called Harris Bay. And uh, there <clears throat> we have these in situ grown crystals that form little crystal gardens. And they have beautiful spinifex textures in places. And uh, these must have grown from the substrate upwards or from the side walls inwards. And um, here we have more of these. There's entire layers of these. And uh, these cannot really have kind of uh, uh, come there. They have grown there. And uh, this is something rum is very famous for. Here's a few more impressions of this. And some of these have star-shaped aggregates. And uh, some people use the term starburst olivin for that. And they can actually be really, really big. Some of these olivin, these in situ grown olivins, can be meter sized. And here's a large starburst olivine. Mr. Donaldson, who described them, um, my undergrad supervisor, he believes that this is a single kind of nucleus that uh, had rays of olivine growing in different directions. And this would be meter sized olivine. In fact, uh, he argues that uh, the biggest olivine ever found is on the Isle of Rum. And this is the one to the left here. Although it's got a lot of feldspar inclusions, he uh, that is uh, Donaldson, he took um, uh, thin sections from various part of these crystals and the uh, optical orientation was identical. So uh, this must be a single olivine crystal, he argued, that must be at least a meter in size. So this would give you a sense for in situ crystallization. 
and uh, these Harrisites, they also kind of got re-sedimented, they broke off at some point. When you have kind of big uh, replenishments, then you would think that uh, these skeletal grown crystal gardens wouldn't be very stable. And indeed, Mr. Martin showed this in the 80s, he grew crystals in a tank. And as soon as we have convection in there, we're breaking up these crystals. That's the little experiment in the bottom right. And what we see in the Pluton or Rum is we have these strings of Harrisite crystals that have been re-sedimented. And uh, this led one of my PhD students, uh, Brian O'Driscoll, to uh, the concept of Harrisite growth in these uh, calm periods in kind of super saturated bottom layers. But as soon as we have uh, more convection, they would break off and then they might get sedimented over and then new cycles might start again. So this is not only true for olivine producing Harrisite. This was also described by Donaldson et al already in the 70s for plagioclase. And this is maybe a little less well known, but not less spectacular. Here we have what uh, is termed the macrobiculospherulitic plagioclase. It's a terrible name, I know, but apparently the editor of the journal requested a very technical name, and uh, so they had to be termed this way. And um, I think the original name was a lot simpler that uh, Donaldson proposed, but this is really crystal gardens of in situ grown plagioclase, and I'm gonna show you some images of that here. So here you can see the layers, uh, so the successive layers of plagioclase growing upwards. And um, it's rather spectacular outcrops in the central part of Rum. And here you can really see a star-shaped one, which led Donaldson to argue that there was a nucleus and there was rays growing outwards. And this is what he uh, uh, used uh, as the initial name. He wanted to call it starburst plagioclase. But uh, as I understand, the editor wasn't so happy with that. So this leads me on to some post-cumulus things. And um, I don't want to go into much detail here. But once you have a pile of crystals, all sorts of things will happen. And uh, here we have these finger structures on the left, but also some fluid fronts that migrated through the post-cumulus pile. And this is the finger structures described by Butcher et al. in 85. And mainly that's uh, residual liquid from peridotite piles that are squeezed out and they might migrate up. And if they hit some troctolite, then like here on the left, they would start dissolving the troctolite. The feldspar would be eaten up by the more aggressive um, 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 picritic or um, um, very mafic liquid. And if you see that in plan view, it looks like uh, the image on the right hand side where you have a little kind of uh, diapirs of uh, the more uh, olivine rich liquid eating through the more plagioclase rich material. Another um, place of fame is the wavy outcrop and uh, recently, more recently or most recently, Marion Holness from Cambridge worked on that. And there has been some discussion about whether it's a sedimentary feature or whether it's metasomatism. I actually think uh, Marion Holness is right because uh, what we see here is it's a fluid front that is cutting across formal layering as you might just about see in the bottom right hand image. So there's this wavy uh, boundary, but uh, the actual kind of structural layers seem to go across this. So this implies that there was fluid fronts migrating sort of intracumulus fluids or magma that was migrating and was causing some uh, modification there. So, and this brings me on to the chromites again. And um, this is the work by Brian O'Driscoll and colleagues. And uh, what they realized is that there is chromite in between the major units, but there's also chromite in the units themselves. And there's even veins of material that cuts across the unit boundaries. So the argument is that you can make chromite in different ways and some of the chromite may actually be recycled or even be remobilized. So it's not always just a unit boundary feature and it's more complicated than that. So some of it may be post-cumulus as well. 
So here's a few more of these images and in the thin section image on the top left, you can see that there is a lot of little chromite specks also in the beridodite above the boundary. The boundary itself gets very blurry and fans out in uh, the very left end of the image. And uh, in the rock image um, on the base, you can actually see a chromite vein on the very kind of left that cuts across. And then there's a pot of chromite in the right of this little rock image. And uh, there's a sketch on the right hand side by O'Driscoll and colleagues that tries to depict this, that chromite can likely form in different ways. So, but how was the intrusion fed? I mentioned it at the beginning. Well, it seems to come from the long loch and the long loch is um, a fault that offset the pluton by some 750 meters. And uh, this uh, seems to, uh, this last movement obviously postdates the pluton, but there's also reasonably convincing evidence that the fault was already active prior to the magmatic activity. So likely the fault is the main reason for the existence. And we've published a paper just a few months ago in Journal of Petrology, where we make the case that the fault movements were likely modulating the input of magma and maybe the layers of the pluton actually come from repetitive fault movements. So here is the long loch viewed from above with the nice mountains of Halleval and Askeval uh, in the far distance in the center of the image. And uh, you see the uh, fault line is marked by lower ground. It's more weathered out. And if you go down there, you can really see the fault is uh, picked out by the glacial erosion rather well. So this almost looks a little Icelandic. So there we uh, clearly have some structural weakness in the center of the island. And the fault is surrounded by intense fractures of different types and different sizes and scales. I had um, a master student there a few years back and he mapped the area building on Henry Emmaleus's map. And uh, he kind of uh, looked at uh, several of the structural features and he believes that uh, there's some what we would call boulevard basins into which brexures were deposited. And uh, this has also been uh, summarized in the recent Journal of Petrology paper that you may want to have a look at if you are interested in that kind of thing. So in that part, you also have, of course, micro faults, and these were hot faults. So they are not kind of a super sharp, but you can see them. So this was material that was hot while it was faulted. Here's another one. And these are extensional faults. So this clearly means that there was space created for magma to rise up. And in the central part near the fault, we also have these really intriguing features. There seems to have been tongs of brexia material flowing at the bottom of the magma system and uh, being kind of deposited towards the deeper areas. And here we have one of these spectacular outcrops. It's um, topography on the magma chamber floor, we believe, and rafts of material, ductile material were deposited on top of it. And then they were flowing over this. You can see the flow kind of uh, um, being marked by little folds. And uh, this material was clearly hot within a dynamic magma chamber situation. And it was hit, uh, or it did hit these solid boundaries at the bottom. So some of these brexures can be rather coarse. And uh, this is really in the fault zone. So likely they are representing material broken off from the side walls that fell into the central part that was marked by the Long Loch Fault. And here is an image with uh, Henry Eberleos on the left <clears throat> with some of these coarse brexures. And now I'd like to take you to the mountain of Trolleval. And one of my uh, former mapping students uh, already some years back took a picture of myself on uh, Trolleval. So this is Val Troll on Trolleval. It gives me a certain personal satisfaction, obviously. But uh, what's really important here is that Trolleval is part of the layered series and you see it breaking up. So this is the source of the material that gave rise to the brexures in the fault zone. And here's a few impressions of that. It's more coherent than the actual brexures, the mega brexures in the fault zone, but uh, it gives a sense for where most of this material 
originally comes from. And the units are dipping increasingly steeply towards the center of the island, uh, towards the margin of the pluton. They are dipping very shallow and round about Trolleval, they're starting to go really, really steep up to about 50, 60 degrees close to the fault zone. So this was uh, the summary of the uh, uh, ultra mafic pluton. And what we see there is sedimentation on various scales. We see good evidence for replenishments in the feeder zone of the Long Loch Fault. We also saw in situ crystallization and we saw soft sediment deformation and uh, post-cumulus processes. And uh, from here, I'd like to kind of draw attention to these sketches that we published in the recent JPET paper. And uh, here we believe it must have been quite a dynamic uh, system that gave rise to uh, these complicated rock records. And what we have in there in this paper is a little uh, uh, sketch like this. And uh, here we see the uh, layered ultra-basic pluton and the overlying rocks of stage one and uh, the hypothetical volcano that's no longer there. And I'd like to use this to kind of uh, move over to stage one rocks now, the felsic rocks. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time on those. I'll try to be swift and uh, um, let's move to these marginal zones. Here they are, the uh, northern and southern marginal zones, and they are characterized by breccias and by ignimbrites, and in the west of the island also by some granites. So just a reminder, here it's these orange rocks in these marginal areas that are on these thin veneers that overlie the pluton. So here's a map I did as an undergrad from one of the marginal zones, the northern marginal zones, and the pink rocks are the ignimbrites. I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but I'd like to point out the blue unit, and that is some of the basement gneisses, the Lewisian gneisses, that are brought up in the ring fault. And this will become a little important later. We have some of these basement rocks in, uh, ex exposed inside the pluton, inside the ring fault, but not outside. So they are, must have been initially pushed up by magmatic activity. And then later on, there must have been some sort of collapse in order to produce these sedimentary breccias and these ignimbrite deposits that we don't see outside. So the uh, inference from that is that there was an early caldera forming on top of a, a dome of material that was formed by magmatic activity. So we have extrusive ignimbrites and we also have intrusive sh uh, sheets and blocks. And here's a bit of geology looking at the pluton in the center and uh, the ring fault in the left of the top right image. And there we have layers of breccias, layers of extrusive rhyodacite and some feeder blocks. And these feeder blocks, uh, they have clearly fed these extrusive rhyodacites. <clears throat> and there's some Fiamme here that I'm showing as well with my old red backpack. And uh, there must have been quite some explosive eruptions in the early stages of the Rum volcano. And uh, this is what I got very interested in as an undergrad. And some of these plugs, these feeder plugs, they show mixed magma with many mafic um, um, enclaves. And that's what we see in this image here. So these rhyodacites, they're not unusual. They have a bit of quartz, a bit of plagioclase, and a very little pyroxene. And they have some flow banding in places. And uh, they have some resorbed crystals because of the magma mixing. And here's a few images of some of these uh, magma mixed situations with some of the crystals being resorbed, but they partly also regrew. So when we look at uh, the rhyodacites, here's some kind of major and trace elements and also some of the basaltic enclaves. And we can see various stages of mixing. We have some interaction between them. And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, but the trace elements seem to have mixed more intensely than the major elements, which means that there wasn't a lot of interaction time for these two units. This was probably on the, on the order of weeks to month. Otherwise, they would have equilibrated more strongly. And also, these are not of the same kind of lineage because the rare earth elements between the basalts, that's the black curve in the top image, and the rhyodacites, the red curve, they cross-cut each other. 
So these don't belong to each other. This is not a mother-daughter lineage. These are kind of replenishing magmas. And uh, this led me at the time to come up with this little model of uh, basaltic magma replenishing this uh, felsic system. But of course, the big uh, question is how does this relate to the pluton, the ultra basic pluton, because that's the basaltic composition. And for that, I'd like to talk uh, just very briefly about the timing of the system. We have uh, some old lavas being caught up in the ring fault. They are from egg and they are dated at 60.6. .6. Then we have these younger lavas, the Kana lavas coming from sky, they're dated at 59.9. And uh, this gives us something like, well, if you take the errors into account, it gives you something like a million years for the entire sequence of events. It's not very long, geologically speaking. And um, we know that because these canal lavas, they rest on the granite. This is the image on the left. And there is some conglomerates in between the lavas and the granite that contains uh, uh, peridotites from the pluton. So we know that erosion was very rapid. So we tried to date the uh, rhyodacites at some point, and uh, while it's a bit more complicated, but we worked out that the eruption age was 60.33, and that fits within the sequence of this one million years. There's some xenocrystals in there, but uh, we come up with this little crystal, uh, with this little story, with this sequence, which uh, you can read up in uh, our 2008 paper. And uh, if you take the xenocrystals out, you come up with a nice little sequence. And this is the yellow circle here. This is the eruption age of these ignimbrites, and that fits reasonably well. And if we do that, then we are probably left with something like uh, no more than, certainly no more than a million years. And the intriguing thing is that uh, when you look at the left-hand image here, the eruption of the rhyodacite actually overlaps the layered pluton. So the important thing here is that this is not two different temporally separated stages. They are probably part and parcel of the same evolution. So the argument here is that likely the pluton, the ultra mafic and basic pluton was forming a depth and producing the heat for the rhyodacites above. So these connect to each other. And in the last few slides, I'll try to convince you that this is the case because uh, this is now work in progress. And here we've done some isotopes. This is a strontium neodymium isotope diagram. And this is all the felsic and a few of the mafic rocks. And <clears throat> for those not so familiar with these type of diagrams, you can look at it a little bit like a map. And uh, the blue area in the top, that's the ultra mafic uh, pluton. And uh, all the points, the reddish points, they are felsic rocks. And the green rocks is the basement, the Lewisian Nisic basement, the very old basement. And most of these felsic rocks, they plot very close to the basement. They must be a mix of melted crust and a little bit of magma coming from the pluton, most likely. So this would make sense that we're melting a lot of crust above such a major pluton, and that's why it's actually not two stages. It looks more like uh, one forming just in a different place from the other. So, and here's some uh, lead isotopes, and they say the same thing. The green is again the Lewisian amphibolites in the area, the basement, mantle and red, and the rocks from Rom, they span the area in between. So, and here just strontium lead isotopes. And again, we get a whole section. This time, we also get Torridonian, the uh, kind of sandstone that rests on the Lewisian that seems to have been involved. But again, we seem to have a lot of crustal involvement. And the final part of my presentation is just a quick look at our recent experiments. I'm so excited about them, so I want to show them. And uh, here we did these experiments. We took some of the Lewisian gneiss from the mainland and uh, we melted them up at 975 degrees, which is approximately the temperature of the hot rhyolites because the rhyolites are very dry. And we just let them at temperature for 24 hours. And of course they would melt. And when we look at them, they would partially melt. 
and uh, we still have remnants of certain minerals like quartz and some feldspar, but we also get melt in there. And we are able, of course, to extract the melt from these experiments. And uh, here we can compare the experiments to nature from the rum aureole. The textures are surprisingly similar. We get sieve textured uh, feldspar, for instance, and all sorts of reaction textures in the partly overprinted gneisses on rum and in our experiments. So we are very confident that we're doing the right thing here. And also for major elements, our produced melt in the experiments matches the yellow samples here, which is the rhyodacites from rum. And moreover, we can look at the isotopes and the isotopes, the whole rock from our melted Louisian, our basement rocks is the yellow one. And uh, if we look at uh, where the actual rhyodacites plot, they plot there. That's the red star. And uh, although it's very inhomogeneous because the experiments are not mixed, they're disequilibrium experiments, but we are realizing that uh, the rhyodacites are a mixture <coughs> between the uh, melted crust and the mantle. And uh, this kind of really brings me on to summarize the whole story as far as we understand it now. And uh, initially, we have a deep pluton that pushes its way up and it produces basalt liquid that's rising up. And here we have magma mixing with melted crust above. We have an initial caldera stage, but eventually the pluton eats his way up through this former stage, this early stage, produces a big volcano on top. And once the activity ceases within a few hundred thousand years, then we erode this top, and this is what we are left with today, the main pluton with these thin veneers of the former felsic stage being present as well. So this uh, brings me to my closing slide, and this is to say thank you to you for listening, but I'd like to dedicate this to Professor Emma Leos, one of my mentors who died only about three years ago. And uh, here's one of our kind of last field seasons in 2014, I think. And uh, uh, he was a great inspiration for me. And for those of you who want to go there, I uh, recommend this field guide. You can buy it, but it's also available for free online. So you don't have to buy it. And uh, here I'd like to close and say thank you for your attention.